when you're in your 20s, you don't have to invest in it so much. It'll just be there. And then as you get older, if you're not investing in that, in your health, then your health will deteriorate and, you know, to a point where you may not be able to recover from it. Welcome to Married to the Startup. I'm Alicia McKenzie, a wellness entrepreneur and digital creator. Alongside me is my amazing husband, George, the CEO who's always ready for a new challenge. We've been navigating marriage and running startups for over a decade, and we're here to share the real, unfiltered journey with you. Join us for insights and candid conversations about integrating love, family, and entrepreneurship. This is Married to the Startup, where every day is a new adventure. All right, welcome back for another episode of Married to the Startup. This is episode number 16. I am your host, Alicia McKenzie. Juma per Lafayette. Is that not my name? That's not your name. That's uh, my limited French. <laughs> We're going to Paris soon. You better. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be Lafayette for everywhere. <laughs> but really, what, what's your name? George. Good job, baby. Yay. No right. one puts baby in the corner. No one Except puts baby. This podcast. <laughs> I'm in the corner. Yeah, we're uh, we're in our new space and we're still trying to figure out the the technicality of everything. It's a little bit more intricate and complicated than we expected, but here we are. I'm going to be a sound engineer before it's over. Oh yeah. New career. Adding it to the resume. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh we did something, <laughs> I feel like I start a lot of our podcasts about this. I like that. Uh, we just did something? Yeah, we just did something. We do a lot of we something. We did a thing. We wasn't did a th- wasn't we, that like a it was. popular thing? It was. So I did a thing. Anyways, um, we have been doing something called Body 20. And it's a workout regimen that is solely based on electromagnetic stimulation. So EMS right? For your muscles, you get into a little suit, you look like a police officer and it stimulates your muscles while you're doing slow controlled movements. Yeah. I think it's more like an Avenger. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what the look is, but I don't know. it's I extremely like, tight. I feel like it's giving Laura Croft. Yeah. I could get, I could see that. Yeah. 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 It's but, really interesting, especially when they, uh, you know, wet the pads down, you put on the wet suit. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. <laughs> that's uh, you're not making it sound appealing. It's amazing. It's, you know, I think wet. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> yes, but it is 20 minutes. And that was honestly the selling point for me because within these 20 minutes, you get 30,000 muscle contractions. Yeah, 36,000 muscle contractions in a 20 minute workout. Which is wild because you normally only get like 1,500, right? In any like given strength session. Because you can only focus on one specific muscle group at a time unless you're doing CrossFit. And I don't want to do CrossFit anymore. Yeah. My joints can't handle it. It's really, speaking of joints, like my knees are super sore from all this like tennis and stuff that I've been playing. Yeah. Well. And your calves are sore. My calf is sore. My knee is sore. Pickleball is <laughs> kicking my ass. I think that's like one phrase that nobody wants to say is, I got injured during pickleball. Yes. Because then you know you're like... And you're, you're old. <laughs> <laughs> you can say it. That's when you know you're old. Yeah. Got a pickleball injury. Yeah. Yeah. And he had a, he had a pickleball tournament this weekend and there was like 20 something, 40 plus men somebody was bound to get injured. Yes. Like the odds are just not in your favor. Not at all. And it's funny because you all are uber competitive and you're all really high achieving and very type A and you can't let anything go. I know. That's the problem. That is the problem. Yeah. I think. And the then body just doesn't respond the way it used to. And it's really funny because it was supposed to be like this cool, low key, I'm going to get food and we're going to have drinks and we're going to yeah. play pickleball. No nobody, one touched the food or the drinks until the drinking. tournament was over. It was like (laughs) no one drank because you all wanted to like perform at your highest level of 40 somethingness. Yeah, which is like 60% of what you used to be able to do. Oh, yeah. Anyway, body 20. Body 20. It's 20 minutes, 36,000 muscle contractions. You are incredibly sore the next day, which I didn't expect. And it's because you're like in full control of how strong the stimulation of your muscles are. 
And I kind of love it. Yeah. I mean, I've only done it twice, so the jury's still out. But um, I've been looking for a workout re- regiment that I could follow. I mean, I've done, you know, my share of CrossFit. And then in the gym, I've been trying to do, you know, other workouts. I did the, uh, you know, the it's okay. 90 day Thunderbro. You I've can done. say that you hated F45 with a passion. Yeah, I tried F45. Not for me. And then, you know, it's the time constraint one. It's the, you know, I, I want to lift heavy because I want the results from hypertrophy and, and all those things, which hypertrophy is not heavyweight, but you still have to do all the same compound movements and isolation movements. And it takes to, to really do it right. The one, I, the one I was following was like an hour and 15 minutes per workout session, three times a week. And it's just, I don't have that time. And then the F45, my, you know, limited experience with it, which was two weeks, was really, yeah, I felt like I could do it at home by myself and not very motivating from the trainers. And it was really just a circuit workout with super lightweight that, you know, I didn't think was going to suffice for what I wanted. Yeah. And the body 20, the, uh, again, caveat it with that, I've done it twice, but I'll give updates on the, the pod as we go through. But it feels like a, a long hypertrophy session where afterwards, your muscles are super pumped, like you've done eight by eights on every particular muscle group. However, you only spent 20 minutes and you really did maybe, I don't know, 10, like maybe 10 compound reps. movements. Yeah. And no, I haven't done weights yet. I, well, I take that back. I started a little bit of weights today. Okay. But it's like five pounds. I think the selling point for me is that you can have somebody who is older with limited mobility, but they can still get a full workout because the EMS pads are doing the work for you. Yeah, they're stimulating and overstimulating the muscle like a hypertrophy session. Yeah, which so if you have to think you're in your 50s, you're in your 60s, maybe you have joint issues, maybe your knees are bothering you, you can't do a ton of squats, um, or you just don't want to do a ton of squats, you go here and it you're if you do it high enough, or if you if you crank up the volume high enough, like you can cramp up your muscles. Yeah, I think uh, rhabdo is a serious concern. Yeah, because yeah. the muscles are firing and you're not working hard. So you know, having that normal feedback of "Oh my God, I'm so tired, my muscles are so tired, I need to slow down," you know, and you push through and get rhabdo. Where this is, you don't even feel it because no. you're just, you know, your muscles are pulsating, 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 and you don't even, even know I, it. I think our friend last week that we took, he got a cramp, so they had to stop really for for a short amount of time before they got back into it. <laughs> well, I got one today when yeah. she yeah. You know, throttled up my triceps. My arms just like Frankenstein and I couldn't bend them. Yeah. I was like, uh, you got to turn it down. Yeah. So body 20, it's it's an interesting concept and it's there's only a few here in the United States. It's supposedly really popular over in other countries. Um, I'm about a month in and I'm kind of sold just because my goal is to, I, I have to do strength training because it's good for your bones. Nobody wants to be a hunchback when they're in their 80s. And as you age, you lose 3 to 5% of your muscle, muscle mass, mass yeah. every decade, right? So I'm in my 30s. I'm in my late 30s. You're in your late 40s. Like if we're not actively trying to keep strength, like you're just going to lose it, right? If Correct. If, if you don't use it, you, you lose it. That's what I heard. We have been together so long. I know oh, all I knew of your you jokes before you were even going to say uh, it. That's not true. Uh, babe, anyway. You need new material. Yeah. But I thought it was also interesting. Like you, um, I don't know. I remember how you found this place, but the. Elisa, the or- a friend of mine. The origin story of the guy who's who owns it is pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's definitely interesting. Like he he used to be in IT Fitness and health and wellness is not his thing, but he hired a franchise headhunter. Franchise consultant. Whatever. Didn't think that was a thing. I mean, I I, I never, I guess, thought about it, but... Uh, it makes sense. Yeah. I just didn't know it was a... Uh, it's kind of like a, a headhunter slash recruiter, but if you want to get into the franchise business. Yeah. It's, it's pretty interesting. So basically, he went through and he did all of the market research on the trends and on the franchises that are available and ROIs and all of this. And then he came back and presented him with a list of viable franchises that he could invest in. Yeah. And you could sync up with what parameters you wanted. Hey, I want it to be, 
in Northern Virginia where it's not a dominant franchise. I want it to be, you know, X, Y, or Z. I want it to be in the health and wellness industry. I want it to be, you know, low investment. Yeah. So rapid payback, like all those things are variables and the filters that they come back with. It's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So he, he ended up on body 20 and he owns the space in, I think it's considered, is it Sterling? Well, that's, that's the one he has, but I think he has. So he has Tyson. The region. Yeah. He has the region. So he has the Tyson's corner area. He has the Vienna area. And then he also has, I think that it's, it's called body 20 Potomac. And those are some, some pretty populated and uh high earning areas yeah it's it's interesting because you know i have never heard of it and i don't I don't know how many are in the u.s but it's not a it's not a u.s based franchise correct no, no it's not a u.s based franchise and um the technology has been a while around for a while right we used to use similar technology when we were competing in crossfit and weightlifting yeah more so for muscle recovery yeah for muscle recovery like we would have these little patches that you would put on certain parts of your body and it would just stimulate the muscle because you want it to heal faster. Yeah. Or you, you had a lot of soreness and you wanted to still work the area. Yeah. So we did that. And then my mom has also used something similar when she had a hip replacement, it was acupuncture and then they would attach electrodes to the um, acupuncture sticks and they would send electromagnetic stimulation through it to help stimulate the muscle for growth and recovery. So the technology is not new, Using it in this function is just, it's really fascinating to me. And I'm I'm about a month in. I think I'm going to continue doing it twice a week, um, probably through the end of the year because I don't want to work out. <laughs> <laughs> but you get the same like after a good workout soreness, which Absolutely. is pretty cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. A friend of mine did this workout, I want to say two weeks ago. We did it on a Tuesday and then we went to like the super hardcore workout on Wednesday. That was probably the worst idea ever because <laughs> Thursday I could not walk like a normal human being. So, um, yeah, I think I'm going to stick with body 20 and then my tennis and then some running and yeah. I'll call it a day. I think I'm just going to stick with the, the body 20 twice a week and the sauna and cold plunge and We'll see. We'll we'll report back in with results. Yeah. But it's very interesting. I think like the business aspect of it, I think, is interesting on the franchise part. Yeah. And the fact that Body Twenty is you know more popular in other Europe countries. And in Germany, I think is what he was saying. Mm -hmm. that, that per capita it's like a soul cycle in terms of membership. Yeah. So pretty interesting. We'll see if it catches on in the US or not. Um but uh Excited to continue and hopefully see some results without the wear and tear on my bones and joints. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the, the my biggest concern is that when you do a lot of like high intensity workouts, you're going to start having injuries. And I don't want to do that because I don't have time for it. Yeah. But I do have time. 20 for minute time domain is pretty nice. 20 minute time domain is awesome. Leaves so much time for other fun. So things. much time for activities. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on. So speaking of activities, we are coming up on Halloween. Yes. And probably I, our family's, one of our family's favorite holidays. I mean, I think we feel decorate like, the shit out of it. I feel like it's our Super Bowl. It is. We go all out. We go all out for Halloween. But one trend that I've been seeing in the health and wellness space is like making it out to be like all of our food, all of our food is trying to kill us. Yeah, I mean, and it's kind probably of, true. Uh, yeah, yeah. I would say all of our mass-produced food is probably out to kill us. Our kids love Halloween. They do. I think, it, you know, you could probably live a healthy, long life abstaining from all of life's vices. Yeah. But, yeah, a long, boring life doesn't sound appealing to me. <laughs> No, our kids love Halloween. So our approach is that we typically live a very intentional life, right? When it comes to use of technology, um, teaching our kids about food, um, spending money, we teach them the right way to do things and the wrong way to do things. Yeah. And not everything is right and wrong. Like sometimes they're, you know, well, yes, body, you know, the difference between wants and needs right? yes. and that. It's okay to spend money on once. Sometimes you just can't spend money on once all the time. Yes. And it's the same with food. There's, you know, it's not bad food. 
No. Uh, other than, you know, some, some stuff's bad food, but there's everyday food and then there's sometimes food. So you don't want to have like a birthday party celebration, but don't eat the fucking cake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's not, that's not how we approach things. And it's mainly because when our kids aren't with us, we want them to make good choices based on actual information and facts, not just because, oh, we scared the shit out of them that it's going to kill them. Yeah. And then the one day they have it and they're like, oh my God, this is so good. And yeah. then they overboard. Right. Right. You don't want to binge eating in the closet because they're afraid to eat candy around us. Like I never want that approach. But when it comes to Halloween, we're very much, all right, we're going out. We're getting as much fucking candy as we possibly can. We're going to sort through it all. We're going to look at the ingredients. We're going to decide, decide what we like because, and now our kids, uh, our kids are very well aware of red dye for red forty <laughs> red and 40. basically all of it. They, they are versed in being able to quickly read through ingredients. Yeah, which is a good thing, right? Like you want your children to understand what they're putting in their body and what it could possibly do to it. Yeah, and the the crazy fact that our country has like a hundred times the amount of approved chemicals in our food than other countries do. Yeah, is just asinine. Yeah, it's a little scary. Yeah. But I think we, you know, our personal approach, I, you know, I, like you said, they go out and they get the biggest score of candy they can possibly get. Right. Like, and get then it they all. come home, they come home and they have so much fun. They sort it all and they got their bags out and they're sorting and they're trading and they get like three, four pieces of candy the first night and, you know, fun size, not like you know, full size bars, but fun size. And then they put it away and then, you know, maybe they get three or four the next day and by like the fourth day, you know, it's out of sight, and then we end up donating uh, a bulk, or of it just candy. ends up, it, or it just ends up in the garbage, Unfortunately. right? Unfortunately, and I think that we, we used to take it in the office and give it away, which is probably a bad idea. I know, but it always went, it always disappeared. Office food—that's a yeah, that's a whole nother issue. But our our goal is to always make Halloween be about the experience of it, and not necessarily. The, the candy. Yeah, the consuming of the candy. Yeah. Right. But, like I want them to love the idea of the candy, but not actually the candy. And I think that's where we're at. Right. Yeah. But that's kind of with anything in life, right? Like you want the experience. Yeah. Ex like, you know, when it comes down to it, I think at the end of the day, life is a culmination of all the experiences that you've had on the times that I, mean, I guess while you're alive. Yeah. <laughs> that's life. Yeah. And not all experiences are great. No. But, you know, it's a culmination of that that makes a life well lived and it's not chasing a destination all the time. And I think that's, that's the good thing about Halloween is the destination one could say is all oh, it's the, the score, the candy. But I think at least what we try to do is it's, it's the decorating of the house. It's yeah. the ofrenda. It's the picking out costumes and the amount of time and effort that goes into costumes is it's insane. It's really sweet. It's very innocent. And it's what I want for them. I don't want Halloween to be about, oh, all this candy is going to kill you and everything. It's just bad. It's terrible. Don't bad for your teeth. Like knock on wood. Our kids have never had a cavity like the boys. Michaela, it ended at Michaela. We learned that gummy vitamins were probably the worst thing we could give Michaela. We stopped doing it. We learned and we adjusted and now our kids don't get cavities. Yeah. Yeah. We've had a pretty good run post that yeah that slight hiccup but, but yeah and i mean it, i don't want to you don't want to be those people that give out like uh you know apples and toothbrushes on halloween right Even no, no one likes that house. i kind of do that. that's the house that gets <laughs> egged and toilet papered right and there's nothing wrong with getting candy yeah and it'd be nice if we could donate it it'd be it'd be you know, even better if we took all the harmful chemicals out of our candy. Wouldn't that be great? It would. Wouldn't that be great that if we just copied what Europe does for their food? Yeah, or you know, most other countries around the world. Yeah. I mean, when we were in Spain, the boys drank Fanta like every day. But if you look at the ingredients of Fanta, there was no dye. So it was... Yeah, I mean, go figure. It was Fanta a, is made with actual fruit juice. It was a what? lighter orange. It was a lighter orange color. It was very pretty. It wasn't this like obnoxiously fake looking orange. And it was great. Like they had a Fanta every day and it, I, I was completely fine with it because I knew what was in it. Uh, it wasn't terrible. Yeah. But I digress. Um, 
we take a very intentional approach to everything in life. Yes. Halloween being no exception to that. And it's not a life of abstinence. No, because that's just boring. Exactly. And it, 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 yeah, it's impossible to be right all the time. 100% of the time, make the right choice. Isn't it you're exhausting? Always, you're going to make wrong choices. So as yeah. long as when you make the wrong choice, you know you're making it and why. Yeah. And it's not something you're going to continuously do. Right. Like I know alcohol is not good for me, but that doesn't mean I don't enjoy a glass of wine once or twice a week. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Mm. All right. Moving on. So I was listening. Um, I don't remember what it was actually. Was it the news? I heard somebody say something about taking a shit job as long as you can work with great people. Like at the end of the day, that was the best outcome for him. Taking a shit job as long as you work with good people. Yeah. Okay. What would make it a shit job? I don't know. Just something that you don't want to do. Something that's really difficult. Um, Something that maybe not is in your wheelhouse or something that comes with a lot of strings. Like who, who the hell said it? Oh my God. Yeah. Trevor Noah. Oh. Yeah. So he, he likened to working at the daily. Daily show? The daily show. He didn't like it? No. Oh, man. No, I think I just listened to a podcast with him. Oh. And the Daily Show was not a great experience. Oh, he did a good job at it. He did a great job. He did a great job, but he did it because he said he would rather take the shit job as long as he could work with great people. And you were talking to a friend recently about their current work situation. <laughs> yeah. And it, I feel like it was a similar thing. Like you maybe have a decent job. But if you're not, if you don't like the people you're working with, it's probably not the best yeah. that you can do or the best that you want to do. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's a lot to unpack there that, you know, let's say your base conditions have all been met. Like you have the financial wherewithal that you don't, you're not forced to go work just to put food on the table. So we'll, we'll take that caveat out, right? Because at that point you got to work pretty much do whatever to, to make ends meet. But if you're at a point in your life or your career where you, you can choose jobs, then I would say, yeah, you should choose the job that fulfills you that you want to do. And maybe the, the question would be, hey, if you're going to have a job that you love doing, but the people are assholes versus the job that kind of sucks, but the people are great, then yeah, maybe you go for the job that sucks. Yeah. But I think... You know, the older I get, the more possessive of my time I get. And yeah. I just don't want to spend time doing things I don't want to do. Yeah. He and also, doing jobs you don't want to do or being around people you don't want to be around. Yeah. He had an interesting point that when all of our kids are out of the house and let's say, God forbid, your spouse passes away and it's just you. He said that. People take their friends for granted and at the end of the day, they shouldn't, right? Because when all of this around you is gone, it's, it's going to be those friendships that you invested in and that's what you're going to be left with. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's, it's a lot like your health, right? When you're in your 20s, you don't have to invest in it so much. It'll just be there. Yeah. Right? And then as you get older, if you're not investing in that in your health then your health will deteriorate and you know to a point where you may not be able to recover from it mm -hmm. i think friendships are kind of the same way if you don't invest in that friendship throughout the course it's easy to have a lot of friends when you're a teenager and when you're in college yeah you have tons of friends everybody's friends you have nothing else better to do and then as life happens and distance happens then you have to make an investment to keep the friendship yeah going and if you don't then that friendship will become tenuous or drift away. And then when you want those friends, right, you can't just turn it back on. Yeah. It's the same with a marriage, I think. Same with a business. Like you can't, you know, go hardcore in a business and say, I got my startup, I'm working 60 hours a week, 80 hours a week, and I'm grinding and we're making headway. And then, you know, I'm taking little breaks here and there because you have to celebrate the wins and, and grow the business. And then it grows and then it gets to a point where, Either you're bored with it or you've moved on and maybe you've made more money or 
the company's been a bigger success and you turn from, you know, startup mode to management mode and then you outsource everything and the people are doing everything and you're kind of not investing the time, energy and effort into running the business. Yeah. And then the business starts to suffer. And then, you know, is it a point where it's you're too disconnected from it to go back in and try to fix it? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, I don't know, it's a long winded way of saying, you know, you have to invest in the things that you care about. Like you have to invest in your financial future. You have to invest in your health. You have to invest in your marriage and your relationships Mm -hmm. and friendships. And if you're working, you have to invest in your career. And if you don't, then, you know, whichever one you don't invest in, or if you don't invest in any, they're all going to suffer. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there's only so much air in that balloon. So you have to kind of pick and choose where you're investing your time. Yeah, I think you and I are coming up on a on a difficult or not even difficult. It's I feel like we've got so many irons in the fire and now they're all starting to to get pulled out. Yeah. Yeah. They're all at a getting to the right temperature where they need to come out. And so it's going to force some decisions. I know. It's it's interesting how, how we've, uh, I think we've had our hands in a lot of different buckets. Yeah. I, I think, you know, trying to, you know, put a lot of seeds out there and see which ones germinate. And then now you got a lot of germinated sprouts and you have to figure out, all right, which ones am I going to tend to, to turn into something? Yeah. And which ones am I going to you know, kind of just shunt. Oh, what? But I don't want to do that. Yeah. Well, you got to make hard life's about hard choices <laughs> and experiences. Hmm. Yeah. You can't do everything. That's the thing that I think you struggle with the most is you, I've gotten, you can't do everything. No, I've gotten really good at saying no. That's the hardest part of life. I think I've gotten really, really good at saying no. I know, you say it to me all the time. Oh my God. <laughs> don't be a baby. No. Because uh, I get a lot of a lot of invites, and I told you I will absolutely be your your friend and your cheerleader between the hours of like ten a.m. and six p.m. After that, I don't want to go. I agree. Right? Like I have an event tonight, and I just don't want to go. Yeah, I, I I struggle with the same thing, and that's part part of you know you have to invest in friendships, and sometimes that investment is after hours, but. You also have to invest in your kids. But that's a business thing too, yeah. right? Like well, business is different. It's yeah. it's a business event. Like you, you is have, it required? You, maybe, huh? maybe you have a you have a hard time like doing networking events anymore, right? Like we just don't want to do it. Yeah, I've just it's a personal bias of mine, and you know, it's not rooted in statistical data. I'm sure there's lots of data that says it's great, but you know, I've never found a networking event that I've ever gone to in my life that actually produced real value for me. Most of my networking stuff comes through personal connections Mm -hmm. that I've made in other ways, not at a forced, hey, this is a networking event at this conference and you're going to meet business partners or longtime advocates or... No, I've never really found those beneficial, like events where, hey, we were at some award ceremony and I was talking to somebody at the bar and developed a relationship and networked that way. Mm -hmm. Yes. Or, you know, God for said at school, um, my kids associations, parents made something, made a connection there, or I was at, you know, some other golf outing or, or or somewhere where I made a a connection, which was more one-on-one versus let's pack a hundred people, 200 people in a room with cocktails and everybody's standing and go mingle, talk to people, network. Yeah. Go network. It's going to be great. Which for me personally, I hate drinking at those because I'm such a control freak that I I don't want to not have control of what's coming out of my mouth, right? I feel like alcohol just makes you a little less filtered. <laughs> That's true. And I'm going to be honest, like I can be such a bitch. Yeah. So <laughs> you pour some alcohol on it, like it just gets worse. Yeah, I, I find that. The drinking at those events is the only thing that you know, makes them tolerable. <laughs> I'm just not, I'm not built that way. I don't, and there's some people that love it. Like they go to these networking events and they can just meet random people and just talk, 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 talk. And nothing has to come out of it where I, I'm more, you know, not to say I'm transactional, but when I'm at those things and I'm 
it mind, is, mindful of my time. It's transactional. I'm mindful of my things. yeah. And I'm mindful of my time and where I'm investing my time. And me investing two hours at a network force networking event is that going to drive my business forward? Is it going to help? And I'm sure that you know it's like marketing. Like, you know, it's hard to tie you know marketing dollars spent 100 percent to revenue because you never know. And you could spend you know an hour at this networking event, and then three years later, this person you know influences a buy for you or something. I don't know. Maybe there's a butterfly effect somewhere, but I've just never personally found that, you know, the investment of time would really pay off where you'd be better served investing your time other places. Yeah. With that being said, I am hosting a luncheon. <laughs> <laughs> a forced networking event. It's no. So it is, it's, I recently started a venture with three other friends and it is called Next Chapter spelled C-H-A-P-T-H-E-R. And it came about because these three friends and I, we usually go to lunch and women who lunch or ladies who lunch always had the connotation that we're going to go drink and then we're going to go shopping and then we're going it's, to, it's, it's made to be this very vapid experience. But when we go to lunch, we come up with amazing ideas and amazing business ventures and we come up with solutions and we work problems. And we decided that next chapter is going to be eventually a event that is held over two to three days. But we are starting with Ladies Who Lunch because we want to take that connotation and we want to kind of, we want to make it positive, right? And we want to help women envision what could they possibly do after everything they should do, right? So you've gone to school, you've gotten married, you've had your children, you've had your career, and now you're like, all right, what's next? So what is that next chapter? Is that starting a new business? Is that going into nonprofit? Um, what are you going to do when your kids are out of the house? Are you just going to travel the world? Um, all of it's possible, but our goal is to really help women figure that out because we've all done different things. We come from different backgrounds. One is a restaurateur and a really, really amazing food blogger, right? Le Chef's wife is huge. Um, Lindsay has founded two nonprofits within her family. Hillary is 15 or 16 years of sobriety. And now she's a coach and she's teaching women how to reevaluate their, uh, their relationship with alcohol and with substances and really helping them figure out what do you, what do you need? Not, and you don't need a drink, right? Like if you need something different and that that's her goal. And I kind of do all of it. I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm the health and wellness optimization queen. Yeah. And now um, moving into, you know, life optimization and yeah. anti-aging. And yeah. A lot of research you do over there. I mean, my goal is to live till I'm 120. Yeah. Which would mean I need to live till I'm 130. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I could make 100, I would be super happy. Yeah. So uh, that's my new little venture. And it's sold out. The luncheon is already sold out, which is amazing because we thought, we were going to have the hardest time getting 50 women in a room. And it turns out it wasn't. No, you did great work. You guys all do. I'm proud of you. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. So that that's my, my new little venture. Yeah, and I think it's it's a undervalued part of the workforce is, you know, a lot of mothers that are returning to their careers or starting new careers and just getting back into the workforce. I think I've personally have hired probably half a dozen of women in that situation. Yeah. And I have always been impressed with the outcomes and never disappointed. I, you know, I think not enough goes into it. And I think you've talked about it before and helped women and that, you know, those things you do as a mother don't show up on traditional resumes and they need to. Yeah. Like the things that you do and the skill sets that you learn as a mother translate the time you donate to your child's school and all these things that you do need to be documented. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is actually leading us into our last 
kind of topic, this will probably be the final solo or not final, but one of the last solo episodes we do for the rest of the year, because we actually have a pretty cool lineup of guests coming on, um, all different entrepreneurs. But one of them uh, is the CEO of Hey Mama. And Hey Mama is a motherhood, it's entrepreneurship organization. And they were the ones that developed motherhood on the resume. So this is where I learned the skills of taking your day-to-day life and making it resume worthy, right? We're going to put motherhood on the resume. When you uh, coordinate a vacation for 10 people over Christmas and planning all that out and figuring out the logistics, like that is real work. That shit isn't easy, right? So how can you take these experiences from staying at home and making it sound or or just putting it on your resume in a professional way? Yeah. Like, hey, not mom- shying away from it or being you know, embarrassed about it or not really owning what that event planning part of your life was. Yeah. Like coordination, communication, Budgeting. planning, project plan. All these are like mini projects that are run all year long. And a lot goes into, like I said, budgeting. Yeah. So, Hey Mama, and we're, we're, um, we're interviewing the CEO of Hey Mama. So I'm actually really excited about the lineup that we have coming on. Um, we're interviewing uh, Greg Schindler. He is uh, the longevity CEO, which, hello, like that could not be the perfect marriage of our podcast. Yeah. I'm looking to extend my <laughs> longevity. So I'm going to have some great questions for him. Yeah, definitely. So uh, that's what's coming up in the future. Uh, but I think that is it for today. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Unless you have anything else burning inside of you. Mm, not at the moment. Not at the moment. All right, guys. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we will see you next week. George, out. Thank you for tuning in to Married to the Startup. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, please take a moment to like, rate, and subscribe to our podcast. Your support helps us reach more people and keeps the conversation going. If you have any questions or topics you'd like us to cover, drop me a message. I love hearing from you guys. Until next time. George, out.